this is going to be more of a think piece than a discussion or a rundown of the news because I've been considering the morality or the immorality of inherited wealth. And I'd be interested to know what you think when I've finished saying what I'm about to say. This whole train of thought was sparked off by an interview uh, the BBC did with a chap called Dominic Cummings. Now, everyone in Britain knows that name, but for those abroad who might not, the bare bones of the Dominic Cummings persona is this. He and his strategy got Boris Johnson into power. He seems to be a cold, calculating man with an absolute certainty that his view of the world is the right one. He does seem like quite an unpleasant person, but I shall have to be forever grateful to him for getting the Conservatives into government. God alone knows what the place would have been like if Labour, headed by Corbyn, had become the government in December 2019. Now, the thing about Cummings was that he was a good scrapper, but a bit of a liability in everyday government. At least that's what it looks like. And Boris ditched him. Oh, people, put not your trust in princes. It was one of those situations where someone very good at what he does is not in tune with the results of what he does. Actually, since I quote the Bible rather a lot, I shall remind you all of the story of Moses, who might be described as a good leader for a bunch of Israelite rabble wandering in circles round the desert while the old generation dies off, but he was not going to be any use at all once the team had made it to the promised land. And so he was compelled to hand over the reins to Joshua, who was possibly a better general and, for all I know, a bit more of a diplomat. So, I don't blame Boris, although I do think that perhaps he's a little too much influenced by his wife, but that's another matter for another discussion. Let's get back to Cummings. Cummings did an interview with the BBC during which he said a lot of very spiteful things about Johnson. I suspect that most of them were absolutely on the nail, by the way, but of course it's all a matter of angle. As we know, a, a situation can be reported on and it depends on how it is reported as to how we see it. The remarkable thing I found about the interview was quite how outspoken Cummings was. He said what he liked. He made no attempt at being tactful. He told tales out of school. He was as ill-mannered, as crude or as independent as he wanted to be and didn't seem to have any thought at all about his future prospects. You see, one of the things that occurred to me when I heard him slagging off Boris Johnson was, who? is going to employ him now. He certainly won't be employed in politics, well, unless he starts his own party, of course, which he might very well do. And I doubt he'd be trusted even in big business. The boardrooms of some financial institution being the destination of choice for retired politicians. Why would anyone in the higher echelons of some company, you know, one that wants its clients to think it trustworthy. Why would anyone there trust a potential executive who is provably prepared to spill the beans about poor relations and dodgy agreements? So I pondered this for a little while and then it struck me. Cummings has no worries about earning a living, uh, about future prospects or providing for his family because well, well, because of this. At the beginning of lockdown, I have to explain, when everyone was supposed to be nicely tucked up in bed, well, at least in their homes, waiting out the wave of infection, Cummings is famous for making a dash out of London to a place where he could be sure that his autistic son would be taken care of in familiar surroundings. If Cummings and his wife got so sick they had to be hospitalised. 
then they wanted to go to a place where somebody could take care of the kid. Where did Mr Cummings dash to? He went back to a cottage on the family farm in Durham. That was the first point. He had a family who could look after him and offer him support and, if necessary, as I said, look after the child. I wouldn't be surprised if this wasn't at least part of the reason for the subsequent truly appalling behaviour of the press, which acted like a pack of sharks in a feeding frenzy. But I suspect that part of their reaction might have been just simple jealousy. This was a man who had a haven. He actually had somewhere to go, in this case to his parents' farm, and that's the point. He or at least his family, have a farm. If the worst came to the worst, well, his father must be getting fairly close to retirement. If the worst came to the very worst, he could take over his father's farm. So he had absolutely no worries about future provision for his family. And that's the important thing about inherited money. When you have a haven, you can be independent. And that's perhaps the one thing that governments in general are seeing as a threat to their power. So a lot of taxation, which is supposed to be for the general good, you know, levelling up, supporting the poor, all the mantras with which no reasonable, reasonable person could argue without sounding awful and selfish. But the fact is, especially with something like death duties, which are pretty hefty here in the UK, and bit by bit cut inheritance down the generations. So finally, everyone is going to be dependent in some way, either on the job they're doing, that is the boss for whom they're working, or they're going to be dependent on the state, you know, if they're unemployed. Except that is for a very small group of super rich who have fancy accountants and the ability to move countries when things become financially too hot in one place or another and, and uh, who can go to tax havens. So unless the situation changes in two or three generations, most people will get nothing or next to nothing inherited from their parents. Now, we all know you have to keep quiet when you're working for a company because that company can get a, well, a, a Twitter attack about something you said 20 years ago or yesterday and you're, you're out on your ear and worse, unemployable. And of course, if you have to depend on the state, you know, like you're on some sort of benefits, uh, well, the government's supplying you with the means to live. Again, you have more trouble criticising them. So you're always going to be worried about being employed or at least supported, which is just about the most effective shut up I can think of. At that point, the government will need no secret police, actually no police at all. You just need people to be worried about the future welfare of their children or their pensions or whatever. But if they can just go back to their parents' farm and produce barley or wool or whatever, well, farming's a hard life, but they do have somewhere to go. They have a living they can earn. Now, we, we don't talk about inherited wealth in such terms as its importance to democracy. It sounds weird. I'm not talking about mega wealth, by the way, but then the mega wealthy will always be mega wealthy. It's the middle ranks I'm talking about, and they're the ones who are being told that inherited wealth is bad. It's sort of a, uh, you know, it's, it's like a social mantra, isn't it? The word tough is an insult. But thinking about it, when a society doesn't have people, some people, some people with an independent income, some things just don't get said because they can't be said. Why not treat yourself or a favoured relative or friend to these magnificent examples of merch? The mugs and t-shirts come in the Granny Opteryx design or Granbo 
with a firearm or the more deadly knitting needles. Go to www.grannyopteryx.com and whatever platform you're watching this on, please click like, subscribe and share, share, share.